Hello and welcome to the one, the only, Gaming Booth Podcast, Episode 8, The Last Jedi. And like that movie, this podcast is deeply flawed and full of plot holes, especially in the multiverse. Joining me this week is Russell. Lots of flaws in this one, lots of flaws. And Jordan. The biggest plot hole of them all. Definitely, I 100% agree with that. And we're here to discuss everything Gamescom. But before we do any of that, we have a job to do because each and every week we are required by law to venture into the multiverse, a hypothetical land of opportunities and possibilities where we solve some video game related problems. This week we're visiting Earth 4943, a world where everything is decided by rolling dice, which explains the 19 world wars, the three times a cat has been made the Pope, and why Nintendo made the Virtual Boy. Not too far from our universe, right? Yeah, it's 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 very it's pretty close, you know, a couple of things different. Is this essentially a Dungeons and Dragons verse except with a cat pope? A couple of them have had three, you know. But we're here to solve a problem for a king of the kingdom of McKingdom face. He's um very unmotivated and depressed. He's sick of rolling to decide things, which is kind of blasphemy, but you know, we're not from here, it doesn't really matter. So Especially for video games, he wants to actually decide something, except we're deciding for him. You know, these people are so indecisive. So the games we've got for him today, I've decided between two that will hopefully reinvigorate him. I want you guys to decide which one you think will help him best, and I'll tell you what that did for him. So we've got Bloodborne or Breath of the Wild, The Legend of Zelda. Well, first of all, you didn't actually pick the game that I would have chose. Instead of you being the one rolling the dice, you are the dice being rolled. Hey, there's a multiverse. I don't decide. You know, this is this exists. Like there are people who live in this world. People have to decide what they have for dinner by rolling dice. It's terrible. How, how many sides on this dice are we talking? I'm gonna have turkey tonight. Oh no, we got steak. Any dice. Anyway, we're not here to talk about turkey. We're here to decide for the king, who's getting very impatient, and he's brought out a couple guards. So can you hurry up and pick? Well, he's got. If this is indecisive king, the last thing he'd want to do is given Breath of the Wild, where he's got too much just random shit he could be doing in that game. So it's an easy pick, really. Like if you want him to be un- a decisive person, he has to pick Bloodborne because if you aren't committed, you're fucked in that game. There's no way out of the way to put it. So Bloodborne. Pretty much, it'd be Bloodborne for me as well, just for the simple fact that it's Bloodborne is awesome. For the fact Bloodborne is awesome, he- he's pretty keen on it actually. So for a while, he's pretty into it. But because he's so powerful, in his mind, Bloodborne creates an internal fear of plagues, blood, and sickness. So he goes on a bit of an inquisition on anyone sick and diseased and wipes them off the face of the earth. And so 200 years later, a super virus wipes out everyone on earth. Does, he do, that, dead. does he do that by a dice roll or is he just like, I'm no more dice roll king, time to roll? Oh, no more dice rolling. He's breaking from that, which... You know, start a couple wars and stuff because people are like, you got to roll the dice, man. <laughs> and, you know, that's just how it happens. So, it was my turn you know, to roll the dice. You can't stab me. Earth's wiped out. And before we leave this disaster that we've created, I need you guys to rate it as we do every week on Multiverse Advisor, not affiliated with that other company so whatsoever. We, just, just to recap, we essentially invaded a universe changed their rules and started war to kill everyone and then left and created a plague that wiped out humanity yes right i'll give it a seven welcome to the multiverse (laughs) give me a seven (laughs) russell i mean it just seems like we completely utterly screwed up this universe in every shape and form so 10 out of 10 (laughs) wonderful wonderful it's got a good rating probably the best so far because we've got two good scores so you know earth four nine four three We'll come back to you at some point. No, we can't. You're all dead. Um, So we'll be back in a moment to talk everything Gamescom. We're talking about games. All the games. Talking games because Gamescom. So we're not talking all the games because there's so many games and so many little interesting bits. But we're here to talk about three very interesting things. Because we're pretty hyped. And to start off, I want something on to pull my devil trigger because we're talking about Devil May Cry 5. Out of context, that sounds so wrong. Uh, <laughs> for those who don't understand the context, uh, that's a Devil May Cry 
in general reference, but Devil May Cry 5 specifically, just because of the song that they keep playing for that game right now. Oh yeah, it's the only song they've got we theorise. <laughs> it's just played on repeat, non-stop, the yeah. whole game. every combat sequence is with this song. In the gameplay footage, which is, like, actually they showed us a lot of gameplay, not a trailer plus gameplay footage, but we'll go into the gameplay footage first. Uh, yeah, exactly as you said, Jordan. They play the Devil Trigger music every single combat encounter. You so. have to. If you don't like it initially, they will make you force you into submission to like that song. Because uh, it comes up a lot. In terms of like what they showed, like we suddenly get a bigger idea of like how the combat's changing in this game composed to the last one. And the biggest form that takes is Nero, who now has his Devil Breaker arm ripped off him in one of the earlier trailers, uh, has now got Robotic Arm, which allows him to do all, all kinds of nifty shit with it. Everyone's turning cyborg in 2018. Yeah, it reminds me of like... It's like the concept of like Metal Gear Solid, like you got the rocket arm and you can do the rocket punch and stuff, but you keep, you, you know, you, you just keep it afterwards. Where it's like, this one's like, no, if you sacrifice your arm, it's gone. And that, oh, yeah. that's becoming an interesting mechanic in the combat where you can use your uh, you know, metal arm to, in the various forms and the various forms it can come in, but you straight up lose it. So if you use it, eventually you come to the point where you can move on with zero arms in your possession, which is a... Uh, it was very yeah. interesting gimmick to be utilized. It's not very combat. handy. It's cool seeing like they're tying all of the different ones to different things. Like you want to be swapping them out for different scenarios, which is really interesting for a gameplay perspective. Yeah, I can I can imagine that some are going to be way more useful than others. Like one yeah. has like a you know like the chain grab. Like I can definitely see some are going to be far more useful. But I think that's that's the the gameplay trade off. Where it's like to keep it fresh and exciting, they want you to be like you know roulating through all your weapon arms. And then going to the, you know, trying to pick up brand new ones and upgrades and stuff. It'll be a really flashy looking game when you're doing all this stuff, as well as the Devil May Cry like classic combat. My question is, where are you getting all these arms? Are you going to like a $2 shop or are you just fighting him on the street? That guy's dead. Let's take his arm. So she's, he's got a colleague who she, she drives the truck uh, and there's the Devil May Cry truck. Well, it's, it's got the Devil May Cry logo on it, but the specifics of how, why that's there is kind of extra stuff. But regardless, that truck, she's creating her, his arm. So I think she essentially, at one point, he goes to a very London-esque telephone, calls her, and then she drives into the location he's in. So mm -hmm. my understanding is that's basically the upgrade system. You call her, she comes in with a truck, and then you go in the van and get your upgrades and stuff. Normally, you wouldn't want to be going to a strange van when it comes up to you, but this one, it gives you new arms. That's that's just cool. Like the the idea of like it's a physical part of the character, and not just like you know usual like these games are like you get an upgrade on your um just a random aspect. Like a oh, hero's now got five strength or whatever. You know, it's cool to see a visual and a f like actual gameplay based mechanic on that arm. Uh, but as, as it come before Mitch, it was like Devil May Cry is all about style. Like that is its thing. And I mean everything you see from, from this footage is like yeah, stylish as ever. Like what is it like super sexy style? I think it's like the SS ranking or SSS ranking in this one. One part that impressed me in that trailer is when Dante showed up and the bike we saw at E3 is actually weapons. And that is phenomenally exciting because two huge weapons, favorite things in the world. It's unclear on a timeline aspect because I think this is supposed to be after Devil May Cry 2 where he is, he is on a bike in that game. But I'm not sure if it's the, Dev, the Devil May Cry 4 weapon where he gets a weapon that's like a 101 different variants. And it seems like maybe that's what it is. The ability to transform between all this crazy shit. And that, that gun... Was, well, the weapon was badass in that game, so I think that may be what it is. But it's just very cool to see Dante have the bike and a cutscene, use it, switch it to two blades, kill some people with it, then switch back onto the bike and drive through enemies in the next bit. It looks very cool. One other cool thing is the, and probably the most significantly difference is like what Devil May Cry can achieve now with power. Because for the most part, anyone who's played any Devil May Cry game will immediately notice in the gameplay footage they showed at Gamescom how familiar each aspect is you go to a little kill room you kill everything in that room get the highest rank you can achieve then you move on to the next kill ring and do the same thing with occasional puzzle like an environment based puzzle interjected and that's kind of the formula but it's an old old school formula but it works with Devil May Cry but where it really gets to do something new is the bosses where they push to an extreme level destructible environments where at the end, like, maybe you're better speaking, Mitch, because, like, to me, I'm, like, I'm so familiar with, like, the concept of these games. It's like, the boss, like, how badass did it look at the end? Yeah, the um, boss is, like, big demons and stuff. It's, like, it's what I expected from Devil May Cry, which not a series I'm super familiar with, but watching the fights and, like, when Nero gets tossed into a building, the building collapses, or if he knocks the monster into the building, it collapses. It's just, like, they're really going all into that technology stuff because it's been a very long time since Devil May Cry has had a like, new installment like this in the classic style. I love how, like, there's a, the context-sensitive, like, a actions in those fights are different depending, I think, on how good you are in the fight. Because I've seen it about three times, that end fight, and one time 
like he gets uh, I've seen a person get sucked into the demon and they get spit out the building and that time <laughs> that didn't happen they dodged it and then he just did enough damage to the demon the demon forcibly jumped out of the building and then Nero chases him out as it kind of collapses and stuff and then like there's a full on like Super Mario 64 Bowser bit where it's like he can stun him grab his tail and spin him into the, like the church chapel in the background which I didn't see anyone do, but I've seen it in the trailer, so I know you can do it. People just hammered on him. Whereas, like, when he gets in that sun face, people just kept attacking him as opposed to, like, going for that tail and doing that grab. So I, I really like not only how incredibly destructible and over-the-top the bosses look. I mean, this is probably the first boss in the game. Probably. And it's already, like, intense. And, uh, you know, I, I with Bayonetta setting the ballpark for absolutely over-the-top intense bosses, uh, I think Devil May Cry already had it, but I think Bayonetta did it even better. I'm hoping Devil May Cry 5 takes it to even higher extremes and all these destructible environments and stuff looks like they may be doing that. Well, like, there's no way another action game like Devil May Cry comes out like Bayonet and they don't pay attention to what that did well because there's no way they weren't paying attention to that game. Yeah, well, there's no question that Bayonet wasn't paying attention to Devil May Cry when it made its game. Like, that was the inspiration, very clearly. I think they just call it, I think they just call it, like, Ultra Sexy Dante. Like, that was kind of the pitch for Bayonetta. In general, like, super hyped. I'm very interested to see who this third character is that they're showing on the promotional art. Uh, rumor is it's Virgil, but at the same time, it's not quite clear who that is right now. So I'm excited for that that character to be revealed. But And maybe a little bit more Dante. The bike was badass, but I'd like to see maybe some more gameplay with what Dante is actually doing it, with Nero as well. So Devil May Cry 5 is very familiar. I want to talk about something that's not familiar to anything because I want to talk about a game called Biomutant. It's a game where you play as a little rodent with a mix of other animals and cop and mechs, fight other mutants. It's a pretty unique looking game. The easiest way that I could describe it would be a mix between Spore and Little Big Planet. It's actually a good description, Jordan. I wonder, it's a good thing you got that in your first try. Um, so are we excited for this game? The visuals is the biggest knock back, in my opinion, where it's like, it, to me, it looks like a very generic Unreal Engine post apocalyptic design. You know, you've, you've seen it before, and it, I haven't seen much environments that have me excited. However... I'm super excited for the gameplay, which in games, that is king. Like, that has to be the most important aspect. And every yep. time I just see something they're implementing in this game, I'm like, I'm impressed by how many separate mechanics we have. We've seen now, like, a moisture ball where he can form into a giant ball yeah, of liquid around. and essentially catch things up in its ball, like Katamara or something. Like, that's really cool in itself. We've seen him get on ride, like, mechanical hands. We've seen him get into a mech suit Fallout style seen or, like, Metroid like Exodus. An, he's hopped in so an he, airship. Like, uh, ride on, on, on like a mutated donkey. Get a giant fist punch thing to punch people into the ground. It seems like there's just so much going on in this game. Like I hope I'm hoping each mechanic feels cool, but at the same time I'm excited for how surprised I am just in the 15 minutes of gameplay I see. Sometimes I go, man, there's mm -hmm. like 10 different mechanics in this 15 minutes of footage. It's very different, and I think it starts with the character creator itself because I found that very fascinating about how much customization you actually have and the colors in like. How your choice of statistics are like intelligence and charisma and like dexterity or strength. They all affect how your character looks. So for the most part, you'll be trying to balance it or just go well with it. And it's just, it's really cool to see them try this unique like style for that character creation. As well as the whole game just has lots of unique stuff. The way I see it, you'll either make yourself look really ugly by mistake, or you've tried so long to try to make yourself look nice, it's just like, yeah, I'm done with that. <laughs> Let's move on. Yeah, I don't think for the most part you're going to look pretty. And it, like that continues on to other future points, because they talk about the mech suit and say how like the mech suit's got heaps of customization options to like how it looks too. So it seems like they're trying to replicate that in every little step of something of significant. So like your character, like your, the, um, the upgradable armor and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Like, Definitely. Um, it's ve it's very cool how the aspects come together. And then, like, to speak of, like, the non-unique gameplay, the combat itself is kind of like a fusion between Devil May Cry and probably the Batman combat, where it looks like you have a countering system, so you can counter their moves, very Batman, and then you have the kind of Devil May Cry aerial or God of War, where you got to knock them in the air and, you know, hit them around and stuff. Or even near Automata. It looks similar to that in two and points. Yeah, you know, the, the traditional hack-and-slash gameplay is basically the way you call it. That... It's got all the aspects going uh, on with it, which is... I don't know if it looks as polished as those games, but it, it, is that, overall, I don't expect it to be. Like, this game is not going to be the AAA like, budget those games have. Yeah, yeah. But to me, it looks like the kind of PS2 era, like, you had all the AAA, but this looks like a AA or, like, 
a more cheaper game, which doesn't necessarily discount it from being good. It just means it has a cheaper vibe to it, which is what I'm getting from. To me, it's like the same vibe Darksiders has, where it's like they're both games that you know don't have the budget these big, massive, ridiculous games have. But at the same time, that doesn't mean they can't do fun, inventive things with their gameplay that make it a polished or enjoyable experience, even though you know you're not going to get the ridiculous vistas you get in God of War or something like that. The biggest notice of budget would probably go to the world. It looks nice, but compared to other games around this time, uh, it looks a little dated date it has like that very generic look to it and the generic how the what world connects it doesn't exactly have like for example like you said dark side as you look at dark sides you go that's got a unique style that suits like that stands out this one the style's okay i don't know if it really is like that much of a standout looking game but the gameplay wise it looks like they're showing so many different things and mechanics and just seeing where they go with it and i think that makes it quite an interesting thing to like when this game comes out i'm fascinated to see how well it goes in a critical sense to see how it all merges together i find it to be one of those games where it doesn't necessarily matter if it looks truly pretty but as long as the gameplay is engaging enough you'll love it anyway and it also feels like they're spending a lot of time on their creature design where it looks like the, the idea because it's a mutant world where it seems like everything's not humanoid i mean it's humanoid i guess but it you know they're not humans they're animals that have got human traits uh, person- personified for it that way so it looks like what they're designing is interesting there like those creatures it's just the world around it is a bit mad but even then i'm i'm very interested in just on a surprise factor i just want to play this and be like not spoiled by all these like crazy things that come up and just go that, that is really cool what they've got going there the biggest thing that i look forward to it is just going in and seeing what crazy characters they come up with yeah but to talk about some crazy characters that someone else is creating we're gonna talk that was not my best segue but we're going with it We're going to talk about a little game from a familiar director who made a familiar series called Dark Souls and Bloodborne and his newest game, Sekiro Shadows Die Twice, is a step away from a lot of what they've done in terms of the way those worlds are set up because Sekiro, from what we've seen, the gameplay they showed off, which first time we've actually seen proper gameplay of how it actually plays and for most people, we're expecting it to play very much like Dark Souls or Bloodborne, but it's not quite like that. In fact, it's very different. As Miyazaki once said, it's not actually part of the Souls series, and we're definitely starting to see that now with the gameplay coming out. It has things that are similar to it, uh, but it's very different at the same time. Yeah, you have a lot of like similar assets of how he opens doors, some of how he uses abilities and stuff. You can just see the influence from other games, but for the most part... It's a game much more focused on mobility. It's much more focused on parrying and using that to actually take out your enemies because some enemies require that to be defeated, which is a very unique step for it. It's way more in line with Bloodborne, where Bloodborne, such a key focus was getting rewarded for attacking consistently, being very um, aggressive yeah, with your attacks. Yeah, getting as visceral to... attacks off. Yeah, exactly. Visceral is the biggest like connection, I think, because that, that idea of like getting in the right time and getting that super kill combo is almost how this game's key focus is, where it's like you need to keep the aggression on, because if you don't, they will just keep attacking you until they'll get an instant kill on you, which is uh, it's cool, because I personally love Bloodborne so much more than Dark Souls. I just love the really aggressive combat, and I much more prefer that over the defensive maneuver. So I'm like... I'm ridiculously excited for Sekiro. Everything I saw, I'm like, yes, yes, yes. I love the mobility aspect of, like, grappling onto trees, jumping off of buildings, hi- like, like running away from enemies, which is interesting. Like, so often you only do that to, like, rush to the next boss, but this looks like you can just straight up sneak past enemies. Like, I just go this way, and they're not, they're not there. Yeah, I find it interesting with this game. Compared to their previous games, it's almost like they're taking an aspect of that which hardly got used and implementing it into a whole new game. For example, with Bloodborne, it was like very quick, no shields, that scenario. This one is more about parrying, taking your time sometimes, or you can just go all out still. Whereas in the original games that they had, it was like mainly holding up your shield to defend. So it's interesting. I think the biggest differentiation is that stamina is gone. It's like you can attack as many times as you like. Maybe not the best idea, but... The opportunity to just keep attacking is there and keep dodging so it really there is none of that getting in the way they're just focusing on that action focused gameplay more than ever yeah it has that that payoff where it's like you don't have a stamina meter neither does your opponent but some opponents you cannot kill until you break their basically combat stance and they can do the same to you 
So one that we saw a lot of people, a lot of footage from this this night, this samurai warrior guy that so many people got stuck on for ages because you cannot hurt him until you break that stance. Um, and that in itself is such an intriguing thing where it's like you really need to keep attacking to get it on and also block, you know, at the right times to avoid their attacks. Otherwise, they just do the same thing to you. See, right off the bat, this game's going to be so hard for me because the one thing I couldn't get right in the other games was parrying. And that's basically what this game's all about, parrying your way. <laughs> I think it will teach you. I think another thing you have to your advantage is that you have this... I'll call it the trick arm because you can have... There is no strong attack anymore. There's just the basic gadget thing, which can be a bunch of different weapons to like something that throws shurikens to an axe, to like a fire sword... No, no, there's lots of options there as well to kind of give you more, like, ways around the whole parrying system because it looks like you have opportunities to all do a whole bunch of different things if you do it in the right way. And as Jordan alluded to, like, stealth is such a big focus of, like, just instantly killing enemies. Like, if you sneak up on them and, like, in a full-on crouch pose, instant kill. Like, so many bad guys, which is, like, maybe you could do that in earlier games, but it wasn't, like, as stealth focus as it seems to be. It was, like, if you sneak up on them... That is, like, the best way to kill these things. With previous games, you actually had to do an attack in stealth, like, behind them or something, like a backstab to kill yeah, them. Exactly. This is, like, it actually goes into an animation where you kill them. Yeah, it's really cool. And to talk about those animations, is like, really cool animations of, like, the boss they showed off where you basically climb up him, jump into the air, slam your sword down in his head. It's this... They're going all out with these awesome kill moves, which is very exciting. And vice versa, because, like, that ogre thing can pick you up and, like, chuck, toss you across the map, which is, uh, you know, more than, like, any of the old games ever did. Like, yeah, having no. them so involved with you on a physics level, like, literally tossing you around the battle arena. Yeah, it's, well, you don't get knocked over. You just, you get thrown somewhere, like, actually thrown, and then you have to get back. <laughs> when I was watching that, I found that bit so funny. Just for the fact that when you eventually die from him throwing you, he just got up and just went ham on his head. And that's that's the thing I was going to say. is like the most important thing with all these games is you dying a lot and how that ties into the gameplay loop. And what's interesting about Chikuro is the subtitle, Shadows Die Twice, where you can actively resurrect yourself. Well, the way they talk about it right now is that I'm not sure if they're fully committed to this system, but right now you can resurrect and come back and kill an enemy and you get the resurrection back. And then if you die, you can resurrect yourself again. So you can just keep that loop of resurrection forever as long as you actively come back and kill a new enemy. You, you will retain, retain it, which is such an interesting mechanic and one that is is brand new to this development. Yeah. Like that is, is, we haven't seen this before. And I would say, logically, it makes it sound easier, but seeing people play the game, it does not seem like in practice it actually is. The one thing that might be a little bit different on that is it might be you have to kill the enemy that killed you. But I mean, that's yeah, the same then, with souls and stuff, but I think now it's just like, you might... I mean, they don't respawn after you come back, so it's more like a tactical thing. If it's like, there could I be can... something tough, I'll leave this easy enemy so I can go kill him. Exactly. I can certainly imagine bosses where it'll be one of those multi-stage bosses or whatever where there's like a big, huge thing and then they've got all these little grunts and you die, you quickly go kill the little grunt to get that resurrection back. It... So if you do die, you can return. That's an interesting point. I'm just curious about the bosses because for the most part, we've had standard boss rooms where you go through the gate and through the fog you're in this yeah. arena. I'm curious. We didn't see a single fog door in these gameplay trailers. I don't think we would call either the two we saw, the Ogre Dude or the Samurai Knight, as bosses. They're more like mini kind of tough units. Yeah, they're tough units. I don't... I'm curious. I'm very curious where they take the boss design because I'm very fascinated to see if it's like, are we in an open environment fighting these bosses? I'm so curious what they do with these bosses in a different kind of design way to design them. Taking a guess from that first trailer, I think that knight on a horse is probably the first boss in that area. 100% of um, boss, yeah. Yeah, and that looked like uh, grappling was a huge focus from the footage we saw. Where they were like, He was like grappling onto the guy in midair, attacking him, or trying to get him off the horse. So I wonder if that becomes a key focus of using your grappling hook or your arm upgrades, prosthetics, as like an interesting way to deal with whatever the boss can deal out. Yeah, it's fascinating that this game is... You know, we saw Shadows Die Twice, some people like hoping for Bloodborne, but I'm very excited to see them pushing new ground yeah. in this kind of... I mean, it's still Soul Z, it's not Dark Souls or Bloodborne. I mean, but technically it's that, it still you know. has a bonfire, but it's more of a checkpoint now, um, <laughs> which also makes the game feel a lot more linear compared to the Souls series. Yeah, I think the difference between its linearity and Dark Souls is that there's a lot of verticality, which makes it a bit less linear, because... Dark Souls, you can only go through these certain paths, where in Sekiro, if you can hop on rooftops, 
and all sorts of grappling to different trees and stuff which we've seen it's just yeah i think the open-ended areas will make it less linear it was just funny seeing platforming actually being like a thing that's considered from the start like dark souls it's always like it just seems like an afterthought like oh this is an awkward ledge to get to that you can kind of run or jump onto in a very awkward fashion where security seemed way smoother very arcade almost in how he that character would jump on between like branches and onto a building and stuff mm. uh, hang off ledges like this is all new ground for from software like stuff they have not done before very much so it's very ninja guide and almost you can see almost, all the yeah. influences of these other games in there but they are definitely taking their unique from soft spin on it and yeah I'm, you can obviously tell we're all excited about sekiro here yeah well devil may cry and sekiro same month march next year like that's going to be an awesome month Oh, yeah, and when, yeah, March 22 for Sekiro, like, it's soon. I mean, From Software have always on the March thing. (laughs) And March is getting pretty hectic with Devil May Cry in March as well, so. (laughs) Yeah, Uh, we'll be back to talk about some of our highlights from the show. Welcome back to the Gaming Booth Podcast. We're going to talk about our highlights from Gamescom and kick it off we're going to start with assassin's creed odyssey and i'm pretty hyped for it because mainly i've been playing assassin's creed origins which is the previous one before and from the gameplay that we saw from gamescom it's going a lot more mythical origins didn't really do any of that until the end game and dlc and this one looks as though it's at least bringing it into end game and possibly throughout the game we saw in the gameplay uh medusa so the question is what else are we going to have? We're going to have like the Minotaurs. We're going to have, you know, other crazy stuff from Greek mythology. Greek mythology has so many creatures. It's going to be so fascinating what they actually put in it. I wonder how far they'll go. Like, I, I have a feeling they might keep it on a grander, smaller human level where it's like, all right, Medusa, it's, you know, snakehead lady. Minotaur, it's a bull and a human kind of but thing. I mean, like, Origins DLC, giant snake. See, so. the way it's... that they did it in Origins was the majority of the game was grounded like that, but then there was a few moments later on that was more mythical. Well, I, I'm thinking, like, if they will go as far as, like, a Hydra, for example, like a giant snake They have beast to thing. put a Hydra in. They can't not put a Hydra. You are I on mean... the sea a lot in this game. You do have your own boat. The uh, world is a lot bigger, but it's mainly water for some of yeah. the parts. So too much water. You know, it looks. It does look like Assassin's Creed Origins, though, a lot. From the gameplay of what I've seen, it looks pretty much identical to Origins, except modified a little bit. As well as this game is set before Origins, so there are no assassins. So they're changing a few things for that. So it's going to be interesting. It definitely feels so. like a game that you're just going to go around just reenacting things from like the 300 movies and stuff like that i know i'm totally going to be doing that and apparently building relationships with characters is the mass effect relationship systems in there can have a relationship with anyone you like including medusa (laughs) we don't know that (laughs) um before i talk about mine i want to talk about what russell's brought well i brought a game that i was a brand new announcement for gamescom so it wasn't more just extra news or whatnot uh, and that was the Man of Medan, which in its... Or Medina, whatever how it's pronounced. Medan. I'll uh, go with Medan. Yeah. It sounds right to me. Maybe. I, I'm not sure. But regardless, the it's a, it's a super massive game that is borrowing, heavily borrowing, mind you, the Until Dawn formula they developed for that yeah, game. I was going to say, I wonder why. <laughs> yeah, which is basically a horror b tropey type movie with the narrative similar to like um, a David Cage game or to Telltale game where you're like, you're Your pick and choosing big choices at every point that impacts the story as you go. Until Dawn, the big gimmick was everyone can die, everyone can survive. And I can imagine that's probably going to be the gimmick for each of these games. Is There's the cast of characters at the start and your choices will define whether they make it to the end or not. Um, but it's, it's, it's just so fun because it's something that I really do think games haven't explored. Like this cheesy horror vibe that can just be fun and just like it's portrayal of it like i can imagine like they'll get the slasher one later where it'll be like you know J- jason or something you know just a kill- killer like trying to kill these these kids and then they bring in like the mytho- the like devil's worst of ex- exorcist stuff like i can imagine all these aspects are going to happen because they're talking about this as a dark anthology was it called like the dark pictures the dark pictures horror anthology horror anthology is their full idea and they're quoting two a year is their goal to get two of these oh. out every year that um Jeez, that, f- that is Productive. that is some kind of you know horror vibe and it, it makes sense because they're heavily borrowing off the template they've already developed um very much so yeah 
and I'm really excited for, like, the potential of, like, those ideas. Like, exorcism would be so cool, like, in a game. Uh, and it's the Detroit... It's got a good system from the get-go. Like, um, I think Detroit's probably the pinnacle of, like, Tropic Game Human, like, of this genre. But before that, Until Dawn was one of the best. And I'm excited to see how they go with it. And, of course, you know, acting's a big focus with, like... What's his name? You know, the Quantum Break Sean dude, like, shows up in it. Yeah, using TV actors or movie actors or whatever in it. That, Iceman that was is some- getting murdered. <laughs> yeah, Und- Under Dawn had that effect. This has that too, and I can imagine they will use that going forward. Get who they can. Like, I'm not expecting Robert Downey Jr. to show up at one of these things. You never know. He you might- never know. You could have as many cameos as possible. Got to mm. shove them all in, and I guess, yeah, I'll talk about mine because this, this game is a real big seal of approval in my heart because it's a hat in time. I reviewed it last year, and it's getting new DLC and the most important DLC. So it's getting full co-op, which has me very excited because that game is great. I think it'll be even greater playing with someone else. How do you think they'll implement it, though? Are you going to be on the screen stuck together, or are you going to be able to run around separately? I think, by the look of it, it looks split screen. So I don't know if it'll merge when you're together or what, but we'll find out in September when that comes out. The They're adding a few other big things because they promised up to two additional worlds. We're getting one of them, which is certain a cruise ship, which... As someone who's gone on a few cruises, it's pretty exciting to see a game set in that scenario and see how much they take from basically sitting around a boat eating food the whole time. So I'm curious what they do with that. And They can always get the Hotel Transylvania vibe, just monsters everywhere on the boat. You don't have monsters, but you have the Mafia, you have birds, you have all kinds of things from a hat in time there. So it sounds like they're taking a holiday, there's a bunch of seals aboard which is great. You have captains of walrus. I mean, what's not to love? I mean, they're obviously Navy SEALs. Like, there's no question. Oh, definitely. And, yeah, that's not the only DLC. You've got basically a challenge mode, which offers around 111, by the look of it, different challenges to do in a hat in time, which unlock different outfits, which is definitely a neat addition that will probably keep people playing longer. Will it make it feel too repetitive, though, or are they actually unique challenges? That's the one thing I'm kind of curious about how repetitive they'll get because there are there's the open worlds there's about five of them now I think yeah five or six and so they're going to use bits of those they're going to use the time rifts which if you've ever played Super Mario Sunshine I don't know if anyone here apart from me has it's got these little where you're taking away your backpack and you put in these little platforming scenarios they'll probably use a bit of those and there are these different rift things which are kind of a mashup of some of the zones so they have a lot to work with and every zone is very different in a hat in time because you've got a train you've got like this awesome sky mountain thing which is one of my favorite areas in platforming like ever is it a free update to the base game or is it uh, gonna cost they say it's free on the first day whatever that means okay. so right yeah to me it sounds like it's gonna i don't think it'll be that expensive it sounds like I mean, you'll get it on the first day for free but if you wait for one day it's gonna cost you a 100 bucks for the most part it's not confirmed to come out on console but they did announce that Hat in Time has come to Switch, which is a great platform for it to sit alongside Mario. It's just going to be interesting. They could have a crossover with hats. All the hats. The dream. It's funny that two hat-focused platformers came out the same year. <laughs> Basically, the things we're most excited about from Gamescom that you know are important to us, and we'll be back in a moment to close the show out. Well, that's it for the Gaming Booth Podcast for another week. Thank you both, Russell and Jordan, for joining me. New problem. I have to be here, so thank you. Uh, if you enjoyed this podcast, you can like and subscribe on YouTube, or you can find us on any podcasting services and do whatever you do there, add it to your list. Let's do it every week because this comes out every Tuesday. We'll hopefully see you again, and goodbye. I mean, she does turn you stone. Oh, crap. We're not fun, that's <laughs> <laughs> I meant to say, Jordan, that's pretty full on, if that's what you're implying, yeah.